Hello and good afternoon. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be with you. This is the debut day, the premiere of a brand new money show. We will be here every Sunday afternoon at this time for one hour, and we will be talking about your money and how to save it, how to keep it, how to make sure you don't lose it. And you're invited to join the show if you want. If you have questions, call 1-800-259-9231. Or you can email me. The email address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org. And Brown has an E on the end. Or call 1-800-259-9231. Well, you know, investment programs are legion on radio and television. Investment sites are proliferating all over the Internet. Go to any bookstore and you can read and see and pick out from dozens and dozens of different investment books. There are more newsletters than there probably are Chinese in the world. The fact of the matter is that talking about investments is a wonderful pastime. People talk about moving indicators. They talk about special indicators that turn, uh, tell you when the market is going to turn. They tell you about inevitable events that have to happen. But you know, it's 37 years. I hate to tell you that, but it's 37 years since I first entered the investment world. And I have to tell you that all of that talk is just that, talk. People love to talk about investments, talk about what the economy is going to do, when gold is going to take off, uh, what, what the stock market is going to do, is it in a bull or bear market. But the fact of the matter is that it's just talk. If you could go back to just one month ago and watch, uh, an investment television show in which they talk about the market and listen to what the people say, you would realize that everything that they said was of no value to you whatsoever. If you just kept the newsletters that you subscribe to and every once in a while read a newsletter from a year ago, you'd be shocked at how little is found out in that newsletter about where the market was going. Now, I'm not saying this to put other people down and tell you that I know what the future brings. No, I'm doing this to tell you that we live in an uncertain world. We are not electrons or molecules which are the same from one to another and the same from one day to the next. We are human beings, and human beings think They may not always think correctly, but they think and they make decisions and they react to events around them and they change their minds. And the point is that because we live in an uncertain world, there is no way we can gather the information necessary to know what the market is going to do in the future. The answer lies not in finding the fortune teller with a perfect record. The answer lies in being able to deal with a world of uncertainty the same way we do in our business and personal lives in which we seem to get along just fine. But the interesting thing about the investment world is that a man, for instance, who has made $20 million by building a a business from scratch by having an, an extraordinarily good grasp of how the world works will walk into the investment world and throw away everything that he knows about how the world works, everything he knows about people, and suddenly think that he's in some parallel universe where all those rules that made him a success in business no longer apply. That now somehow there are special uh, configurations that he can divine on a chart, and that will tell him where the future is going to be or that he can find a fortune teller who's got an extraordinary record of predicting turns in the market. Well, what I'd like to do today for our inaugural broadcast is to give to you what I call the 16 golden rules of financial safety. They are the rules that I have followed successfully and which I have helped others follow successfully for dealing with an uncertain world for being able to handle their money, their savings, their investments, no matter how little or how big, 
without getting caught up in all of these phony rules that seem to pervade the investment world. Let's start out with rule number one. Your career provides your wealth. You most likely are going to make far, far more money from your business or professional life than from your investments. Your investments can do a great deal to enhance what you make in your business or professional life. Your investments can make a far, far better retirement for you than you would have otherwise. Your investments can make sure that you've always got the money put away to take care of some catastrophe that might otherwise have ruined your life. Your investments can do so much for you, but you are not going to start with a thousand dollars and go to a million. It just simply doesn't happen in the real world. In all my years in, of investing, I have never found anybody who actually made a fortune on investing alone, unless he was in the investment business and he made his fortune by selling advice, not by using it. But, of course, I have met many, many people who have made fortunes working as professional people, uh, building a business or whatever it is. So the point of rule number one is don't take risks with complicated investment schemes in the hope of multiplying your capital quickly because what's happening is you're risking a great deal in the hopes of gaining a little and with very little chance of success. Rule number two, don't assume you can replace your wealth. The fact that you earned what you have now doesn't necessarily mean that you could do it again. Markets change. uh, Laws change. And as time passes, increasing regulation by the government makes it harder and harder to earn a fortune. So treat what you have as though you never could earn it again. You might very well be able to earn it again if you lost it all somehow, but you can't count on that. So don't take chances with money that's precious to you because you may never get it back if you lose it. Number three, don't work with borrowed money. When people go broke, it's almost always because they were operating with borrowed money. You hear uh, stories about famous people like Bunker Hunt or John Connolly or Donald Trump who were flying high and then suddenly... Uh, they're declaring bankruptcy, filing for Chapter 11 or whatever. But it's almost always because they have borrowed a lot of money to go with what they had already to do some gigantic development project, and the market goes against them, and it takes very little to wipe out the equity that they had in that. So when people go broke, when you hear about it, It's As I say, it's almost always because they were operating with borrowed money, even though they may already have been quite rich. But if you handle all your business and investment affairs on a cash basis, there's practically no chance you could lose everything, no matter what might happen in the world. Well, we will be back in just a couple of minutes after we take our first break. And when we come back, we'll continue with these rules. And if you have any questions or comments about this, then just call me at 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. Stay aboard. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. So glad you're staying with me. And we will continue with these 16 golden rules of financial safety that I found so helpful to me in the past. Rule number four, no one can predict the future. And, of course, I talked about this at the beginning. 
And it really is true that any event in the investment market, whether it's what the stock market's going to do tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or when the price of gold is going to change or what the inflation rate is going to be, all these events result from the decisions of hundreds of millions of different people. And those events never unfold as expected. Investment advisors have no more ability to predict the future actions of human beings than psychics and fortune tellers do. Rule number five, no one can move you into and out of investments consistently with precise and profitable timing. Now, you're going to hear about many Wall Street wizards. Some guy that's got a fantastic record. He's called the turn in the markets 12 times in a row. But the investment advisor with the perfect record up to now most likely is going to lose his touch the moment you start acting on his advice. Now, that may seem like a gag, that the guy with the perfect record up to now is going to lose his touch the moment you start acting on his advice. But it's actually a very real phenomenon with a scientific basis. And that is that you don't hear about the guy until he's got this record. And if he's had eight lucky calls in a row, he suddenly becomes famous, you hear about him, you bet on his advice, and his lucky streak has run out. You didn't hear about him at the beginning. You don't read articles in Barron's or Wall Street Journal or hear on television or the radio about some guy who's about to begin a lucky streak, who just missed five investment calls in a row, but now, starting this week, he's going to get eight in a row, and so you might as well get on board now and take advantage of those eight. No, you hear about it after he's had his eight eight lucky calls. And believe me, luck had a great deal to do with it. In the same way, rule number six says no trading system will will work as well in the future as it did in the past. You're going to come across all kinds of trading systems or indicators that seem to have signaled correctly over and over and over and over again where an investor's money should have been. But here again, you can assume that the systems will probably stop working once you put your money on the line. Again, it is because people have been using their computers to figure out what worked in the past. What indicator did tell what happened correctly the last five times in a row? Ah, I just found myself a reliable foolproof indicator. But all he has found is a series of coincidences, which are about to end. Rule number seven, I think, is very, very, very important. And it's at the heart of a great deal of what we can do to invest in an uncertain world. Rule number seven says, recognize the difference between investing and speculating. Very, very rarely does anybody define the difference between investing and speculating. All they tell you is, this is a safe investment. Oh, this is an investment with very little risk. Oh, this, that, and the other thing. And almost always they're talking about a speculation. When you invest you accept the return that the markets are paying to investors in general. In other words, you know that you're not getting anything special. But when you speculate, you're attempting to beat that return, to do better than other uh, investors are doing. Uh, You might think you're going to do this through uh, astute timing, forecasting, stock selection. Whatever it is, there's the implied belief that you're smarter than just a mere mortal investor. And there's nothing wrong with speculating. I'm not trying to put speculating down, provided you do it with money you can afford to lose. But the money that's precious to you, I believe, should never be risked on a bet that you can outperform other investors. Again, the difference is that any time you think you can do better than what any old person walking into the market can do, then you are speculating. And of course, if there's a prospect of doing better, there's also also a prospect of doing worse. Rule number eight, don't ever let anyone make your decisions for you. You don't need a money manager. 
and above all, never give signature authority over money that's precious to you. Signature authority is where some other individual has the power to be able to make the decisions for you and execute those decisions because he has the ability to do it on his signature. It does not require your approval, trade after trade after trade. And you should never put money that's precious to you in the hands of someone else to have that kind of power over your money. You you have no way of knowing what someone else may be prompted to do by personal pressures or problems. You may never, uh, you don't know what may happen to his health that may cause him to make screwy decisions. You should just never do that. And as I hope you will come to agree with as we have this series of programs, you don't need to do that. You don't need to become a sophisticated investor, and you don't need to put your money in the hands of somebody you think is more sophisticated than you are. Number nine is very similar. Don't ever do anything you don't understand. Now, it doesn't matter that your favorite investor, uh, your favorite investment advisor, your best friend, uh, even your brother-in-law. It doesn't matter if any of these people understands something that you don't quite understand. It isn't his money at risk. It's yours. And it's better to leave your money in the bank or in a money market fund or in treasury bills than to take the chance that because you're doing something you don't understand, tomorrow or next week or next month, you'll discover that there were risks or liabilities associated with this undertaking that you didn't see at the outset. Now, the fact that you don't understand some particular type of investment doesn't mean you can never be involved in it. It just means you shouldn't be involved in it until you do understand it. If it looks intriguing to you, take the time, figure out what it's all about, learn about it, read a book about it, do whatever it takes to figure out how to do this, and maybe someday you will understand it well enough that you can confidently do it on your own decision-making process rather than on the touting of somebody else who says, this really is something worthwhile, you ought to get involved in it. So don't ever do anything you understand. Well, we've got seven more of these rules awaiting us, and we will go into them and continue with this when we come back from the break. If you have a question, call me at 1-800-259-9231, and we will be right back. This is Harry Brown. you by the Genesis Communications Network. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. I hope you like this music. I tried to pick music that is happy because I think we live in a good world. And I can probably name for you a few thousand problems that need to be corrected in this world. But still, life is wonderful. And we can make the most of it with the money that we earn and prepare for our futures and take care of things, make sure our money is safe and maybe uh, even grows at a good clip. So I thought we should have some happy music for this show. Continuing with our 16 golden rules of financial safety, number 10, keep some assets outside the country in which you live. And this is just very, very simple. Don't allow everything you own to be within the reach of your own government. Now, you may like the government. Maybe you like it a lot more than I do. But the fact of the matter is that administrations change. Governments decide suddenly to do strange things like monitoring your email or putting roving wiretaps on your phone and maybe even confiscating your money. 
Uh, you've probably heard about the asset forfeiture laws, where some law enforcement officer can just simply attach your house, attach your car or something else because he thinks it might have had something to do with a crime that's committed. You may never be convicted of that crime. You may never even be charged with that crime, but the fact of the matter is that you would have to sue the government to get your property back. But that's just one way in which governments do strange things and suddenly take what you have worked so hard for away from you. Uh, in the same way, gold was confiscated back in the 1930s, and other things can happen. If you have something that you own, something that's valuable to you, that is out of the reach of your government, you will be less vulnerable. And maybe even more important, you will feel less vulnerable you won't have to worry so much about what the government will do next. And actually, it's not very difficult to have some money outside the country in which you live, to set up a foreign bank account. It'll be one of the things we'll talk about in this show as we go along from week to week. Number 11, beware of tax avoidance schemes. Tax rates are way too high in the United States. I personally don't believe there should be any income tax at all. I believe government should be a lot smaller. But the fact is that tax rates are low enough that I think you might gain very, very little from the risk and, and the effort of constructing elaborate tax shelters. And tax shelters almost always involve things that you don't really understand. And that's a violation of rule number nine. Complicated tax schemes may include many vulnerabilities and many liabilities of which you're not aware. So be very cautious. There are so many ways you can shelter your earnings from taxes in that are simple and involve no complicated schemes, such as having an IRA or a 401k or a Keo plan. Uh, there are all these things, and we will d be discussing them to a certain extent week after week. Rule number 12, don't depend on any one investment, any one institution, or any one person for your safety. Every investment has its bad periods. The inflation of the 1970s just ruined stocks, bonds, even treasury bills. And the 1980s were terrible for gold. Real estate, uh, which supposedly never goes down, had a very bad time when the tax rules changed in 1986. And as we've seen, you can't count on institutions either. Banks, savings and loans, pension funds have gone under. So you must make sure that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, that you are not in a position where any one event could be disastrous for you. And based upon that advice, we come to number 13, which is create a balanced portfolio for protection. For the money you need to take care of you for the rest of your life, the money that you're counting on for your retirement, the money you're counting on to take care of your children, for that money, set up a simple, balanced, diversified portfolio. And I call that a permanent portfolio because once you set it up, you don't ever have to change it because you've set it up to take care of you whatever might happen. And since you can't predict from month to month or year to year what's going to happen, there's no point in changing the permanent portfolio. And the permanent portfolio will be the object of a lot of our attention in the course of this show. I'll explain it in much more detail in a further show. But for now, let me just say, design the portfolio to assure that your wealth is going to survive any event, including events that would be devastating to one or more of the portfolio's investments. And let it protect you against even the unthinkable, the things that you really don't think have a big chance of happening, but could happen. Now, Despite this grandiose, ambitious plan for a diversified portfolio, it doesn't really need to be complicated. You can achieve a great deal of diversification with a surprisingly simple portfolio. 
And as I said, we will get into that as we go along. Rule number 14, speculate only with money you can afford to lose. If you believe it's possible to beat the market, if you think you can get a better return than other people are getting, then set up a separate pool of money, a second portfolio, what I call the variable portfolio, because you will bury it as you go along. It won't, won't be permanent. You'll get into gold when you think gold is going to go up. Uh, you'll be all in cash when you don't have anything in mind in particular. You'll be in stocks when you think stocks are the thing. You may be part, partly in stocks and partly in something else when you're, you've got two possibilities. Whatever it is, you can speculate to your heart's content because you have made sure that this pool of money contains no more money than you can afford to lose. So that if everything goes wrong, you don't have to start your life all over again. And this is very important. The two-portfolio concept I have found over the last several decades to be the key to intelligent investing. One portfolio, the permanent portfolio, is for the money you cannot afford to lose that you're counting on for the future. And the second portfolio, the variable portfolio, is one you can act on, speculate on. When somebody says, hey, you've got to get into gold right now, or you've got to get into silver, or this uh, oil futures, uh, whatever it is, you can bet some money with the variable portfolio. You don't need to have a variable portfolio if you don't want it, but if you're going to speculate, that's where you should do it. Well, that music says that we need to take another break, but we're going to be back very, very shortly, so stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. Money Talk with Harry Brown on the Genesis Communications Radio Network. Welcome back. Harry Brown here, and we are talking about financial safety, and I've been going over the 16 golden rules of financial safety. If you have any questions about them, now that we're coming close to the end of them, 1-800-259-9231 is the number, 1-800-259-9231. Or you can email me. The email address is question at harrybrown.org question at harrybrown.org and brown has an e on the end of it all right we've covered 14 of the 16 questions number 15 enjoy yourself with a budget for pleasure to enjoy your wealth i think it's important to allow a budgeted amount that you can spend each year without concern for the consequences and if you stay within that budgeted amount you can you can just blow this money on cars, trips, anything you want, knowing that you aren't blowing your future. I think it's very important not to sacrifice the future for the present. But I also think it's important not to sacrifice the present for the future. Because you don't know how much of a future there will be. You don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know how circumstances might change by which you can't enjoy the future that you may have sacrificed for over the distant past and the present and so on. It's important to enjoy life daily. It's important to enjoy life yearly. It's important to enjoy it as you go along. And I think the best way you can do that guilt-free is to just simply look at your situation and decide that, this is, that there's a certain amount of the money that you earn that can be put aside to be enjoyed for whatever you want to do at the moment and by having budgeted that in the future in the uh, pardon me for having budgeted that to begin with you don't have to worry that you're spending too much or that you're blowing the future you've already figured out that this is what you can afford to do 
And if you do that, then I think you will enjoy life a little bit more. Life is meant to be lived, not to be died. Number 16. Whenever you're in doubt about a course of action, it is always better to err on the side of safety. There are going to be plenty of circumstances, plenty of situations, plenty of occasions that will arise when it seems as though you ought to do something, but you can't quite make up your mind about it. And in any area of life, not just your investments, when you can't seem to make a decision, it usually means that you don't have enough information. When you do have enough information, you feel very decisive. You know exactly what you want. But when you don't know exactly what you want, that's when uh, it's an indication that you probably don't have enough information. So it's better to pass up the opportunity. And maybe this is a time-sensitive opportunity. Hey, you've got to do this right now. If you don't do it now, the opportunity is going to pass. Well, all I can tell you is that if you pass up an opportunity to increase your fortune, I guarantee you there will be other opportunities coming along that supposedly will increase your fortune. But if you lose your life savings, you might never get another chance to replace them. I remember once back in the 1980s, there was a very famous investment advisor who's been writing newsletters for years and years and years, for decades, appearing at investment seminars, and he's always talking about some big event that's about to happen, usually a catastrophic event. And uh, he writes long, long promotional pieces that he sends out by direct mail telling you about some uh, enormous thing that's going to happen. The Chinese are going to get militarily active, and that's going to affect the investment markets. He was a big advocate of the idea that Y2K was going to bring the country down, and so you'd better act in advance, and on and on and on and on. And I remember one time in the late 80s that he wrote one of these promotional pieces, and he entitled it The Last Train Out. This was your last opportunity to buy gold at $500. He guaranteed that you would never get another chance to buy gold at $500. And he was right. Gold never gold started going down, and it never rose back up to $500 again. I don't care how urgent somebody seems to be. The fact is that it is never the last train out. It is never the last opportunity to do what you need to do for your investments. So you should be very, very cautious. And if you don't understand something completely enough to be decisive about it, then what you should do is just put it off, even if you think you're passing up an opportunity that could have been yours. Well, those are the 16 golden rules of financial safety. And when we come back in just a couple minutes, I will uh, explain to you how you can get a copy of those rules if you'd like to have them. Uh, they're on my website, and I'll tell you how to take care of that. And uh, we will also, uh, in our last segment, cover a few more things about what this program will be doing. So please stay with me. This is Harry Brown. Listening to Money Talk with Harry Brown on the Genesis Communications Radio Network. Again, Harry Brown here, and this is the final segment, so let me talk a little about what we'll be doing in future shows. 
I've mentioned the permanent portfolio as the way to handle the money that you can't afford to lose. And so in future broadcasts, we'll talk about making up a permanent portfolio, one that is simple enough that you can do on your own and you won't need sophisticated advice. I'll also talk about ways of implementing that portfolio where you can get the investments uh, or what kind of investments uh, best suit that portfolio. From time to time, we'll talk about the variable portfolio as well, uh, s- certain things that may seem to be worthwhile risks to take for the money that you can afford to lose. And I'd be glad to comment on various investments uh, that or speculations that seem to be appropriate if you want to call them in in future shows and say, what do you think about this right now or that right now? And I'll also talk about the principles involved in making speculative investments. There are certain principles that, if adhered to, might make sure that you don't make a lot of really foolish mistakes. We'll talk about some of the simple tax deferral methods that are available, like IRAs and KEO plans and 401Ks, and just ways of putting off the paying of taxes into the future, which is always a good idea. We'll talk about foreign bank accounts and how to set them up. We'll talk about the economy, too, uh, the current economy, the prospects for the future economy, and also how the economy works. And I'll be glad to answer questions on that subject because I think the more you understand economic principles and how these principles affect the day-to-day workings of the economy and what happens when government intervenes to try to make the economy better and so forth, I think the better you understand all of that, the more contented you can be with your investment program because you'll understand that your investment program is based on realistic principles about the real world in which we live and not a fantasy world. And I want to make it clear also that just because I am not a fan of forecasting and just because I'm not a fan of trading systems and so on doesn't mean that I think that investment advisors can't be valuable. An investment advisor can be a great asset because he can explain to you the things you don't understand about investing. How does this work? Uh, how, did the bond, how does the bond market work? What causes bond prices to change as interest rates change? And things of this sort. And investment advisors can give you a great deal of information that you can't get on your own. And you should take advantage of that. Just don't expect them to be able to lead you into and out of every single market without any problems whatsoever. This is Harry Brown. I hope you'll be back next week. <laughs> 